morning. It's really great to be chosen as the kickoff presenter of our series. And I'd like to join Dennis in saying, please come and, and hear our series this year. We have a great lineup of speakers. I'm looking forward to them also. So tonight, what I'm going to do is take you on a journey. We're going to go a little bit around the world as we learn about all the different estuaries of the world. And also, it's going to come back and help us to learn more about our own estuary here, the Indian River Lagoon and the St. Lucie Estuary. As you know, about nine months ago, when the rain started coming in, on a very wet, rainy season we had this year, that a lot of attention turned to the St. Lucie Estuary and the Indian River Lagoon. So over the last nine months, I know that many of you are very aware of all the great effort, including your own effort, to help to focus on conservation and restoration of the lagoon. So we'll talk about that too tonight. Okay, did they tell you when you came in you're going to have a couple pop quizzes? Well, there won't be too many, no grades or anything, but think about this. We have all the land in the, on the earth, and how much of that land is connected to the ocean. So what I'd like you to let me know, if what percentage of the Earth's land surface connected to the ocean through the rivers? Who thinks that's about 35% of the land? OK. Who thinks it could be as much as 73%? OK. Who thinks it's 87%? Oh, that's starting to get a majority here. Who thinks it could be 100% of the land? OK, so it's somewhere between 87 and 100%. So how is it possible that this much of the land is connected to the ocean through the rivers? The connection is through the watersheds. Now, what's a watershed? A watershed's a drainage basin. A watershed is an area of the land that has the surface water from the rain, it has the lakes, it has the rivers, the streams, the tributaries. It has all the water that can run and funnel into a river. It also includes the groundwater. So let's take a look at these worldwide watersheds. Look at the bottom here. You have January through December. And do you see what's happening? These are all the watersheds, and they're changing with the rainy season, with the monsoon season, with the snow melting, the ice melting. So for instance, the Amazon is the largest watershed in the world. And so it changes according to the rain. We've got the monsoon area up in, in Southeast Asia. We've got the Mississippi that's going to expand its watershed depending on the snow and the ice melting and the, and the rain. So these watersheds is what makes up 87% of the water that comes into the rivers that meets the ocean. And so it's really amazing. I mean, and, it, and the watersheds can change a little bit, just as you saw in this clip here, depending on the weather conditions and the time of year. Look at this. This is the Mississippi River watershed, known as a drainage basin. It's big. It's 40% of the United States. It takes in 31 states and two Canadian provinces. So that means that here's the, the Mississippi coming down, and it's what? Draining into the Gulf of Mexico. So it's a very large area. We have a watershed here in, in Florida, right, that helps to lead into the different tributaries and areas that drain into the Indian River Lagoon, into the St. Lucie Estuary, the Caloosahatchee, Biscayne Bay. OK, so we've talked about the watersheds. Now let's talk about the rivers. One more pop quiz for you all. What's the longest river in the world? Who thinks it's the Amazon? Okay, who thinks it's the Nile River in Africa? Who thinks it could be the Yellow River in China? Okay, how about the Ob in Russia? Maybe. Okay, how about the Mississippi? 
No takers on the Mississippi? Okay. It's the Nile. It's just a little bit bigger than the Amazon. And um, these are all the, some of the top five longest rivers in the world. So let's take a look at these really quick. So here's your Nile. Look, it runs all the way up through Africa, and then it ends up having an estuary at the very end in Egypt. Then you've got the Amazon. There's your Mississippi. There's the, the Yangtze, which is in uh, China. And then the Ob up there in Russia. So some very, very large rivers um, in the world. And I already, already kind of gave you a hint. All these rivers end up in an estuary. So here you have the watersheds leading to the rivers, leading to the estuaries. Quite remarkable what these, rest, what these estuaries are actually servicing. They're servicing quite a lot of the land mass of the earth. So here's a definition that was um, stated by um, Pritchard in 1967. By the way, where is this photo taken? Sebastian Inlet. I have a few, quite a few aerials. I want to give credit to Indian River by Air. They um, allowed me permission to be able to use some of their, their gorgeous photos. So an estuary is a semi-enclosed coastal body of water that's connected with the sea, and in this case, through the Sebastian Inlet, which is um, diluted with fresh water that's from the land, that's drained off the land. And so that's what makes an estuary. In very simple terms, the estuary is where the rivers meet the seas, as we just talked about earlier. But it's also where the people meet the sea, and we're going to talk about that more. The earliest of civilizations came to live around the rivers and the estuaries. Where's this photo taken? Sebastian, and this is the Sebastian River. So it's providing the fresh water into the salt brackish water of the estuary. There's a lot of other names for estuaries. Um, we already know the Indian River Lagoon is an estuary, but it's called a lagoon. And so the reason for the different names is because of the geological formation of the actual estuary. So can you name an estuary that's, that's called a bay? The Chesapeake Bay, the largest estuary in the United States. Excuse me? Mobile Bay. Delaware Bay. Naconic Bay. San, San Francisco Bay, very good. Okay, so these are all different bays. How about um, some bayous? Those are where the, where the water comes in in a very slow stream and it mostly falls into a marshy type of land. New Orleans, right? Lagoons, we know lagoons. What about some sounds? Those are very large, usually, bodies of water, typically very deep. Puget Sound, Long Island Sound, you guys are good. How about some sluice? A little more trickier. How about Elkhorn Slough? Heard of that one? It's in California. So all of these are estuaries, but they have slightly different names to them because of the, the way they're shaped. So let's talk about an estuary and what we call the zones of an estuary. Where, where's this photo from? Which estuary? Very close to here. Yes, the St. Lucie estuary, okay? So we've got the estuary, we've got the forks, we've got the ocean on the, on the, on the right-hand side. So let's start with the beginning, well, I mean, I suppose you could say there's two beginnings to an estuary, but we're going to begin at the ocean side. Right here is where the marine interface begins. This is where it's the saltiest of your estuary. And so it's going to be about 36 parts per thousand. That's full strength salt water. And then you've got what's called the marine dominated lower estuary, where you're just starting to get some fresh water influence here. 
And so this is going to be more like 18 to 25 parts per thousand. Then you've got the middle estuary, where there's quite a bit more mixing coming in from the freshwater and the salt. And it could be as low as 5 to 18. So once you start to get into number 2 and number 3, you're starting to get into what we call brackish water. And then you have the upper estuary area. Both here, the south and the north for forks, are um, essentially fresh. And they're coming in, and they're mixing with the salt water coming from, from the ocean. So there's other ways. We talked about the fact that the estuaries have different names, whether it be bays or lagoons or sounds. There's also geological characteristics when you look at different estuaries. So for instance, uh, anybody know this particular estuary? Chesapeake Bay. Chesapeake Bay, very good. It's called a coastal plain estuary. So estuaries in general came to be after the ice age, after there was, after the ice melted, the glacials were seeded, it allowed an opportunity for the salt water to come in to those parts of the land. And then it also made essentially cracks for the rivers to begin. So it's about 18,000 years ago that the water, that the seawater started to come into these areas and that's how the Chesapeake Bay was, was formed. That's also how the St. Lucie Estuary was formed. It's a coastal plain estuary. How about this one? This is a um, tectonic estuary. San Francisco, very good. And so it was formed because of earthquakes. The land coming in, the faults, making very deep crevices, and then the ocean water came in that way. And then we have fjords. This is a, re a receding of glacial. There's a lot of fjords on the west coast of the United States area. And then this is interesting. Did you know there's a freshwater estuary? Totally freshwater. The reason they call it an estuary is because it's two bodies of water coming together that are very different in chemical composition. And in this case, it's a river, a freshwater river, that's leading into Lake Erie. And so because of their chemical differences, they call it they call it an estuary because you've got two sources of water coming together that are very different. This happens to be a delta. I'm not quite sure if you'd figure out where this is um, because it's a freshwater delta. However, deltas come in when there's a lot of sediment that comes down the rivers. They make a triangle type formation at the mouth of the estuary, like the Mississippi Delta. It's after the Greek Delta symbol is how they got named. This happens to be, a, it was just a beautiful photo from, um, from a lake in New, New Zealand, but a very good descriptor of a delta. And then we've got the bar belt. And you probably recognize this area, right? Indian River Lagoon is a bar-built estuary. It means that there was a lot of accumulation of sand over the years to build a barrier island to protect a lagoon in the middle. So the barrier island separates the ocean from the actual lagoon area. There's a lot of bar-built estuaries in the world. So here you have Florida, the Indian River Lagoon, the bar-built, Barrier Island. Anybody from New Jersey? Which bay is this? Barnica Bay. I meant to ask you that earlier, Dennis. It's a bar built estuary also. Then we've got um, a bar built in England. North Carolina, anybody from North Carolina? The Palomico, is that right how you say it? Yep, so that's up there. Then you've got Texas has lots of bar built areas, and then there's one along the western side of Australia. So they're all very similar to our Indian River Lagoon. The other way to characterize the estuary is through the mixing and circulation. Water in an estuary has a couple of different ways it can move. It can either move with the wind and provide circulation. It can, if it's near an inlet, like the uh, Sebastian Inlet, it can have a lot of tide that comes in and out, right? It could um, have some current, maybe, that's, um, that's provided by freshwater input. 
So the amount of time that the water stays in the lagoon or, or the estuary is based on what's called its residence time and will be based on those factors of circulation. And also it's based, uh, also it's good to understand that so that you know more about the flushing and how water moves in and out of the lagoon. And that's a very important aspect of understanding the dynamics of a estuary. The estuaries are characterized depending on this mixing and circulation. So for instance, the salt wedge, the Mississippi has a lot of fresh water. You saw how big the watershed is. It's flushing in a lot of river water. That river water is fresh, and it's sitting on the top. And the salt water from the Gulf is sitting underneath. So there's a salt wedge that happens. Highly stratified would be a situation where there's um, both a fresh water and salt water coming in at the same time. Slightly stratified means that there's not as much fresh water, but more salt water. And that would be an example of the Chesapeake. Now here, in our area, with the St. Lucie Estuary and the Indian River Lagoon, they're both very shallow water bodies. So they don't have a lot of stratification. When we see a lot of rain coming, and when we have releases of the water in, from Lake Okeechobee, what happens is that the fresh water from Lake Okeechobee actually flushes out almost all of the lagoon water during that period of time. So it doesn't get a chance to stratify. And the, because they're very shallow, they don't really mix that much either. So for the Bay of Fundy, and most um, fjords for that matter, there's a lot of vertical mixing because uh, typically it's very high salt water then in those, except when there's melting of the um, snow in the, after the winter. So just to step back for a minute and think about this, there's so many estuaries in the world. There's many in Asia, Europe, in Africa, and also the Americas. They're all over the world, remember, because all the rivers lead into an estuary. We talked a little bit about this already, how important estuaries are to people. The earliest civilizations made their homes around estuaries, around rivers. And as we all know, we enjoy the estuaries for, for pleasure, for enjoyment. But the estuaries are also very important for, for transportation, for fishing, for, um, for, for ships and moving commerce. So there's a lot of economic value for estuaries. I was really surprised to learn this. 22 of our 32 largest cities in the world are on estuaries. So here's a few of these largest cities of the world. Where's this one? New York, Hudson River, right? This one might be a little trickier. Boston, somebody said Boston. Can I have another suggestion? New Orleans, no? Think overseas in, in Asia area. Tokyo, exactly. How about this? Recognize it? California? Yeah, Oakland, San Francisco Bay Area. Up here? It's overseas in England. The Plymouth, Plymouth Mouth, Plymouth Harbor. So let's see if we're right here. So it's interesting, you know, these are very large cities that are sitting on estuaries. The Hudson River, unfortunately, is one of the most polluted rivers in the world. It's had um, a lot of inputs, a lot of pressures over the years. Tokyo Bay used to have a very large tuna fisheries, but it has been quite overfished. There's about 7 million people that live in the Bay Area. And then Plymouth Harbor, I just found out that they're really working on a sustainable improvement of their estuary. Jakarta in Indonesia, 10 million people live around that estuary. A lot of pressure um, on the estuaries. We're um, quite fortunate here in our state of Florida that we don't have very large cities that sit on the estuary. So as we're talking about these large cities that live on estuaries, 
I thought it would be very interesting for you to know, this is, by the way, that's the only graph I'm going to show you tonight. The 10 most populated river basins in the world are home to 25% of the population. So what are we talking about? We're talking about the areas in India, the Ganges, the Krishna. We're talking about the areas like the Yangtze and China, the Yellow River in China, Indus in Pakistan, the Nile in Africa, the Danube in Europe. So these are the largest river basins in the world that support a quarter of the population of the world. And it's expected to increase. Right now, these, this area provides about 10% of the gross domestic product produced. And they're expecting it to go up to 25% by 2050. That's as much gross domestic product as putting US, Germany, and Japan together. So this is a very significant amount of the world's GDP. In order for it to grow to that 25%, they're going to be very dependent upon fresh water. Because fresh water is what's going to enable the growth of the population and to support the, um, the living and the commerce in that area. This, was a very, this is a very interesting um, report. It's about the water and the economic growth by HSBC report in 2012. So let's take a little deeper look at this. So these are some of the same river basins that we were just talking about. Here's the Ganges, the Nile, the Indus. I also put in Texas, and there's a reason for that. These areas are suffering from fresh water, from having enough fresh water. We always think here, oh my gosh, too much fresh water is not good for our estuary. There is a balance. There's a very important balance of how much fresh water is needed to keep an estuary essentially functioning as an ecosystem, but also how much fresh water is necessary for human civilization. So for instance, in Texas, the Colorado River is not providing enough fresh water for some of their estuaries because maybe it's been dammed or diked or diverted for water to drink for agricultural areas. That's the same in Indus, Pakistan. This should be covered in water. But what's happening is the salt water is making its way almost 40 miles up the river because the fresh water has been held along the way and hasn't made it down to the mouth. So there's something, a new term that I've learned about recently. It's called environmental flows. And this is determining what that balance is. How much fresh water does this estuary need and how much can be diverted? And it's very similar to what we're going through here in Florida, trying to figure out how much fresh water can our estuaries hold, but at the same time be stored on land and use, be used for drinking water or agriculture. So in October 2013, just a few months ago, we had a workshop here at Harbor Branch called Our Global Estuary. And it's a new initiative, and the steering committee comes from all across the United States. This initiative has been um, supported initially with the kind and generous support of the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Foundation. The idea was to bring a group of people together to start the discussion about estuaries, both locally, nationally, and globally. Because really, all the estuaries need to be understood so that we can learn from each other. And so that was really the idea behind the global, uh, our global estuary initiative. And so some of the information that I'm providing you tonight um, throughout this presentation are thoughts and discussions that have gone on um, during our uh, national workshop that we had in October. So we're going to continue to contemplate together. I told you we were on a journey together tonight. So have a seat. Well, you guys are seating, maybe. Where's my seat, by the way? Um, this is the beautiful Indian River Lagoon. We're going to contemplate a few things together. 
So first of all, we know that every estuary is unique. We know that geographically, we know circulation-wise, size-wide, population, management of fresh water, different stressors, pressures, impacts, et cetera. They all are unique. However, there's very strong commonalities across all of the estuaries worldwide. And what are those commonalities? The first one is that it's an enormous filter. Every single estuary was meant to be a filter. And when I say filter, it's used to having that fresh water come in. It's used to having nutrients from the land come in. And it processes those nutrients. And it turns it into seagrass, or it turns it into seaweed, or it turns it into productive oyster beds and all the other types of animals that live in, in the estuary. And it's also the most fertile es ecosystem on Earth. It's by the acre. It's more productive than a typical Midwestern farmland. That's how productive an estuary is. It also provides buffer zones and protection for coastal areas um, from storms, from floods. Um, so that very important that way, too. One of the other commonalities is that it's home to spawning habitats and nurseries. There you go. This is a seagrass bed, very productive area, and the mangroves. And here's your young little fish swimming through their nursery. This could be fish from snook, from sea trout, from redfish, from flounder, from bass, you name it. The, these productive areas, these seagrass and mangrove areas of the estuary are some of the most productive areas for our commercial and recreational fishing. They also hold um, also shrimp and crabs and oysters and clams. So we've talked a lot about, over the last nine months, we've become very much more informed about the different kinds of pressures or stresses on our Indian River Lagoon and our St. Lucie Lagoon. So that every estuary is going to have local stresses. Some of them are very similar. Um, for instance, some estuaries have issues with dikes and dams, which can be a very big problem for fish such as salmon that need to run up the river in order to do their spawning. And that's part of the main fishing in the Columbia River on the west coast in Oregon and also um, up in Alaska as examples. We know about excess nutrients from fertilizers, from septic systems, from agricultural land. We know that there can be chemical pollutants too. And we know that estuaries can suffer from overfishing. On top of the local stressors, you also have your global stressors. So across the world, we're seeing changes in climate. Just like this winter, we've had some very interesting weather, very strong winter storms, and then very warm weather. These drastic changes are part of what's called climate change. And then we've got sea level rise in estuaries. And there's little, um, small amounts of, of salt water rise. It's 2.25 millimeters per year. Right, Dennis? We had Ned, Ned Smith here earlier today talking about that with us. But what's interesting about climate change is that there's small amounts of temperature changes is enough to make a difference in whether or not your fish spawn longer. You might have, like for instance, striped bass. They might spawn longer periods of time, so you might have more, more striped bass in your estuary. But the other thing is that this mangrove here, it's making its way north. Fortunately, mangroves are good things to have. But it's making its way north because it's getting warmer. And I don't know if any of you heard on NPR a couple of weeks ago but there was a report about why it's moving north because it's getting warmer along the eastern seaboard. This happens to be the Chesapeake. 
And the Chesapeake is watching very closely the changes that are happening with the water temperature changes. There's a very good um, report that was just out last year about climate sensitivity on, on estuaries put out by NOAA and the um, Estuarine Research Reserve System. So let's stop and think about this a minute. There's a need for action. There's no doubt that we're putting action in place here in our local community. There's a need for action to strengthen the estuarine resilience so that we can look at both societal choices and balance the use of estuaries. So what do we mean by resilience? How do we build this estuarine resilience? How do we take our action to make a healthier estuary? If you think about yourself, sometimes you get sick and sometimes you don't. And it might depend on how you're feeling, how stressed you might be, or what kind of things you're under pressure on. And so if your immune system is strong, you're not as likely to get sick, or possibly you're not as likely to stay sick as long. That's the same as an estuary. If an estuary is built so it can be more resilient, so for instance, when it has a lot of fresh water come into it, it can manage that fresh water. It can be that enormous filter and take care of it. It's when the resilience goes down that we start to see more stresses on the environment. And so there's this fine balance between societal choices and how to balance with our estuary ecosystem. So there's lots of organizations across the United States, across the world, that are working on recovery of estuaries and Restore America's Estuaries, the National Estuary Program. We have one here in the Indian River Lagoon. Back in the 1970s, the National Estuarine Research Reserve System, there's 28 estuaries throughout the United States and territories that are being observed and protected. And then the Global Restoration Network has a great database of other restoration projects. So what are we looking at? We're looking at restoration, rehabilitation, recovery for healthy coasts, healthy economies, and healthy humans. So what you want to think about is right now, this very moment, we have to protect what we have right now. So that's the first thing. And there's a lot of effort going into protecting what we have right now then we need to start looking at how can we help the ecosystems to recovery, to actually move forward and be recovered. So we have two things that we have to work on at the same time. And that's, that's, about, that's what a lot of discussion and a lot of help and a lot of quests to make change right now is happening in, in our state of Florida for the Indian River Lagoon, the St. Lucie Estuary, the Caloosahatchee, Biscayne Bay, and many of the other estuaries. So think about recovery like this. Think about a timeline, or think about a ruler if you want, something that has increments on it. So we're looking at trajectory to recovery. Where are we on that line of recovery? How are we going to know when we get there? So we know we need long-term data sets because we need what, what's called baseline data. And we need to know if there's going to be a change, we need to know how effective that change is. Biological and chemical indicators, I'm going to talk about those in a minute. And we want to know how human activities have changed. And so all of this together will help us to determine how we're moving on that trajectory to recovery. So indicator species or indicator elements. Let's talk about biological. We've got everything from the microbes and the very small organisms that are living in the sediment to as big as uh, the megafauna like the dolphin and the manatee. We've got the birds. We've got our macroalgae, grassalaria, our sea grasses. We've got our fish, our oysters and clams. Those are the species that are going to tell us how well recovery is taking place. Because these are the species that live, these happen to be species that live in our Indian River Lagoon and St. Lucie Estuary. So if there is a die-off of seagrass, 
and we want to see recovery, what are we going to do? We're going to keep mapping it and understanding it, and that will give us a clue as to where we are in recovery. In terms of the physical and chemical, the physical and chemical has to do with the changes in the water quality. And actually next week, Dennis is going to talk with you a lot about water quality and how we measure it and what it means. So I'm not going to go into that in much depth. Stay tuned for next week. So restoring an estuary. As I said, lots of places around the world. This happens to actually be Florida Ocean Oceanographic Society um, putting out oyster, um, oyster shells for oyster restoration. And we also have sea marsh restoration, different types of projects around Florida, around the United States, around the world, making recovery. There's lots of examples out there. So we can really draw on those examples and use them to the best of our capability here. So I came across an article a few weeks ago, actually, that really struck me, really got me thinking about this recovery. It's Borgia et al., 2010, just written not too many years ago. They looked at 51 different restoration and recovery projects around the world. What struck me about this article is that it's not one thing to just say, we're going to restore the estuaries. We're going to get to work right now, and hopefully by next year it's going to be done. We have to think long term. And the reason we have to think long term is if we've got persistent impacts like wastewater or sewage, it could take 10 or 25 years to get to a place that we call restored or recovered. Because it's been a long time that these types of nutrients have come in, and there has been damage, so the damage has to repair itself. Then if there's been a dredging type of project, maybe the intercoastal waterway might have been dredged. Well, it will take a little bit of time for recovery of the, of the microorganisms that live there. It could take anywhere from one and a half to 10 years. Then you've got the fish that come back into an area. It could take 10 years to put the assembly of the fish back into place. So as a summary, um, Borgia et al. said, some cases can recover in less than five years. And some cases, full recovery could take 15 to 25 years from 100 years of impact. So this goes back to what I was saying. We've got to protect what we have now, and we've got to think about how we're going to recover. We're going to think about that trajectory of recovery, how long it's going to take us there, how many indicator species we're going to need to look at to know that we're there. One thing I want to let you know that we probably won't get back to the original estuary that we started with. But as time moves on on this planet, I don't think you'll ever get back to what we quote say the original. But what we will know is that our ecosystems will be healthier, the fishing will be there, and we'll have all the other ecosystem services that are very important for not only the ecosystem, but for the people. So I think we know a lot about recovery and restoration in the world that we can really, really, really learn from. And this was such a, a fascinating paper to read to learn more about these different projects. So a couple of, um, couple of thoughts to leave you on. The importance of estuaries to local economies and to the populations is the most effective lever for change, meaning that you in this room and all the work you've been doing over the last months and maybe years is helping to make change. And so I think you should be really proud of yourself, first of all, for coming and listening to the lectures and learning about the estuaries and also supporting your local legislators as they start to move forward to make changes to, um, to make recovery for the local economies and for our ecosystems. We're going to have to do it as an integrated system. We're going to have to keep the human in mind, us in mind, and we're also going to have to make sure we keep the natural environment in mind so that we can um, benefit both and have a sustainable ecosystem. I have a, a few people to thank and then a parting, um, a parting thought for you. So. Um, my dad, who was here earlier, helped provide some of the photographs that you saw. And then um, Indian River by Air, this gentleman, John, takes, goes up in this powered parachute 
and takes these beautiful aerial photographs. So if you go to his website, um, you'll find some spectacular photos that he's taken. He gave me permission to use a few of them. I've taken a few photos from our own collection here and also the internet. Um, the Global Estuary Steering Committee um, is featured here. Many thanks to them for all the creative ideas and putting together the workshop and continuing the discussions. The foundation for their support on our global estuary. Also want to thank the community. Want to thank all of you. Want to thank all of the researchers. We have many researchers at Harbor Branch, at ORCA, at Florida Oceanographic Society, at many of the agencies, the water management. We want to thank the legislators. We have um, Senator Joe Negron, who's running the Senate Select Committee. We had um, actually uh, Ed Felding, the Martin County Commissioner, was here at the 4 o'clock um, presentation. He's, he's also overseeing a collaborative effort with the five different counties. And then Patrick Murphy is letting our voice um, be known up at the federal uh, government. And the community. How many of you got to go out and do um, Hands Across the Lagoon? Wonderful event on National Estuary Day. So it's not only that event, but it's all the different events that are going on around our community. There's a lot of hope in our community. There's a really um, an, an amazing amount of good energy going into helping our estuaries um, conserve and come to recovery. My parting thought to you is that anything we do locally is definitely going to benefit from a global perspective. We know the importance of our estuary, and we also know the importance of estuaries worldwide. And I think that's really important as we move forward with our protecting what we have now and also looking towards recovery. So I want to thank you very much for um, being here tonight. I'd be happy to take some questions and continue the discussion through, uh, through questions. Thank you so much. Thank you.